All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next speaker is John R. Diaz. He's a senior technical game designer at Electronic Arts. Please join me in welcoming John to our virtual stage. Hello, thank you everyone for coming to this. If you're looking to get a crash course into all the ways AI is used in and to develop the video games you hopefully play, watch, stream, or know someone who does, then you've come to the right place. AI, from my perspective, is an autonomous robot that can either help humans simplify problems that are difficult for us or a piece of cake for a machine. Over the recent years, it's been incredible to watch the progress of abilities we have been able to build into robots and the machines of today. Just look at you know, a Tesla factory or an Amazon fulfillment center, or my favorite, the Roomba. Cars are on the cusp of being able to see and model the world around them and intelligently drive themselves safely around in the dynamic and unpredictable world that we live in. We pretty much have Jarvis from Iron Man, AKA Vision for you comic book fans out there at the tip of our fingers in all of these natural language processing assistants in Siri, Cortana, Alexa, and whatever Google calls theirs. It's an astounding feat. Something I realized only just now when being invited to come speak for AI4 about how video games use AI. And my work as an AI system designer and a technical designer is the fact that inside of a video game, it's not about extending an AI's capabilities, but really limiting them. What I mean by that is in a simulation, we as developers create the game, the AI has access to the entire state of the world at any given moment. It's all cold, right? So the practice of AI design and development for video games is meant to entertain, train, educate players. So it's not about creating perfect AI, but it's making fair AI. And so while there are a fair share of interactive simulations out there that don't have a direct antagonist or an adversary or a threat, the majority of games that I know and love and play with my peers and friends all build artificial intelligence for very specific reasons. And that's to provide a challenge for the player and encourage that loop of mastery and learning to triumph over the challenge at hand and repeat that over and over, right? Gradually increasing that, that carrot and that pursuit and helping them become more proficient in the game's mechanics. So we as developers look to proportionately increase that challenge to keep the sensation of growth that drives the player growth in their learning, practicing, adapting, and overcoming to feel that wonderful feeling of winning. So with that, welcome to this talk, how AI outsmarts players and the evolution of AI in video games. My goal is to catch you up to speed on where we are today in AI application, where we've come from and where the future may lead us. So if you haven't looked at the $180.1 billion video game industry for talent, creators, engineers, I want to leave you in believing that our worlds are more closely aligned than you may have thought. So we'll start off by going through AI and games. On the second part of this, we'll talk about how AI is used to help us make these games. And then finally, we'll get a bit speculative and predict on where we may go in the next 10 to 15 years. My background has been as a game designer working on games since way back in 2007. I studied game design and development at Full Sail. I've been wrestling with controlling AI and NPCs, non-playable characters, to bend to the will of the designer in creating the perfect experience for the player. And this, although it changes over the years, there's still some core foundational bits that haven't changed even through today.
I'll mention also that these are tricks that we've used in games dating far back from the Xbox 360 days, even up to now on PC and the current generation of technology. And even now today, where I work on core tech in Frostbite, the engine that powers some of EA's most notable games like FIFA, Madden, Battlefield, and things like this. I also have a little podcast there out of play area where we speak to developers more on these topics. When you think about AI and games, I'm curious what comes to mind. Is it perhaps Alphabet's own deep mind, AlphaGo, teaching itself Go and becoming the first computer program to defeat a Go world champion, Lisa Dull in South Korea back in March of 2016? Or is it perhaps IBM's Watson showing the world the seeds of natural language processing, winning first place prize of a million dollars on Jeopardy in 2011, beating Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings? For me, I want to go back a little bit before all of that to some of the key algorithms that came up and are applied today in games. So dating back to the 1950s, we have some key algorithms discovered by Esker Dijkstra, where he conceived an algorithm to find the shortest path between nodes in a graph. As he tells it, it took him 20 minutes, allegedly. Around in that, well, in that decade, we had George Mealy presented a concept for a method for synthesizing sequential circuits, what was now known as the Mealy machine. In addition to Edward Forrest Moore's work on the Moore FSM or finite state machine, those two works combined would later lead to uh, the state machine, which is heavily used even to today in how we organize and instruct NPCs and AI in the world. Fast forward to the 60s, and this is where, in Stanford, Peter Hart, Nils Nilsson, Bertram Raphael would build upon Dijkstra's work and found A star as a path planning algorithm or a graph traversal and path search algorithm. So it's a staple of how we in games plot where an NPC or AI can traverse to or not, introducing weights and, and, and costs to you know, going over rocky terrain or going down uh, over water or something like that. And it's a staple in all of my AI game classes in Full Sail University. Now, with those little building blocks, we can go over to the 70s. So in 1972, Atari's Palm came out into the field developed by Alan Alcorn. And this black and white image is beautiful to me. Two paddles, dotted line in the center, a ball score for each side, and all bound to one screen. So you know once you hit the top of the bottom, that was the limit of your movement. Imagine developing this game and needing to test or someone to play against. And not always will you have someone readily available to jump on the sticks. So in this nice confined space, telling a paddle to move up or down, which I imagine if you kind of plot uh, X and Y axis and zero is the center of the screen, you pretty much only have to move in one dimension from probably one being the topmost point, zero the center, negative one to the bottom. And you can plot a point for moving the paddle with some speed and some direction. And so pretty much as soon as the ball flies over the net and makes contact with a paddle, we can already map out a trajectory and the computer will know when it will make contact with the right-hand side of the screen. So it knows exactly where to be in the perfect spot to return that ball every time. But remember what I was discussing about earlier is that it's not about perfect AI in games, but it's about fair AI. And the way we go about achieving that is by trying to make it more human-like. And all we have to do are model two things. Reaction time, where we'll simply delay for X tenths of a second before 
the paddle starts making choices on which way it's going to go and how fast it's going to go. And additionally, uh, accuracy, right? So we will introduce some probability of percent that it's going to make the wrong decision. And those are key elements that you'll see reused over and over and over in a game designer's AI tool bag, right? So moving on to the 80s, we have the beloved Namco classic Pac-Man or Puck-Man as it was originally titled in Japan, developed by Toru Iwatani. So in this game, you know how it goes. You play Pac-Man, eating pellets, clearing the map, and while avoiding being touched by the ghosts. I want to call out this state machine that I have in the center there, where you see chase, stagger, and frightened. Again, building off of the state machine work that we identified built in the 50s, you can see how this is used to map out the three states that the ghosts can be in, right? So, so when the game starts, you have the red ghost and they're going to chase, they're gonna fluctuate between chase and stagger. And there's a 2D grid and the way that we calculate your path to the player's position is through using those pathfinding algorithms, AKA A star. So at the start of the game, ghosts are initialized to scatter and you could see that each ghost has a designated quadrant of the map. And over some time, they'll jump to chase where each ghost knows the position of the player and then they each have a unique behavior associated to them. And so this is the introduction of archetypes. As game designers, we are taught to train the player to distinguish NPCs with unique appearances or this, you know, and that they have distinct behaviors or decisions that they make given the same choice. So back in those days, a cheap option was a simple color swap. So each ghost has a distinct behavior as a result of their unique color. And together they combine for using those roles in how we do today, right? So the red ghost is targeted to target exactly the player's position. The pink ghost is set to target four tiles in front of the player. The blue ghost is set to target four tiles in front of the player, but two tiles in front of the red ghost, right? So helping to kind of create this pincer attack movement. And then the orange ghost that we call the zoner, he has an interesting pattern that is more get into a zone around the player, but never directly chase him. And so together, all four create this very interesting dynamic where it feels like they're working together to catch Pac-Man. And then of course they have the frightened state where when the player eats the power pellet, they kind of scatter and flee. So it tends to create a very smart looking AI. I think so. Okay, now we start moving over to the 90s. And this is, some might say, the finest era of gaming where, well, essentially making the jump to 3D and adding that third dimension. Uh, many a game developer's top five games come from this era. 98 was particularly impactful with Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid published by Konami that I credit as having pioneered the concept of stealth video games available on the first Sony PlayStation. This game was mind blowing to me in my teenage years. Uh, you see the game enemy took that state machine pattern where this was denoted back to the player to say, um, look, the, the soldiers are patrolling and this is your opportunity to infiltrate. And what was added here that's of note is you can see that the dots, the red dots presented above are your threats. And then they have a vision cone. Because again, in the 3D world, there's no reason that the AI doesn't know everything about the state of the world. And again, we want to limit their knowledge to give players a fighting chance. So instead of letting them see as far as the, uh, they could in a space, you limit and restrict their sense of sight, their sense of hearing, and even their sense of smell. 
Um, and so you feed that back to the player to give them a chance to sneak and move around, right? Unique, very unique behaviors that this resulted in was, again, this cycle of a cat and mouse gameplay where you could be detected if you're within the vision cone or you create a sound that is a short distance away, they would come search, they would kick in, you would kick into alert to be careful. There's something suspicious going on. They're aware of you. And if they identified you, then they would go into combat, right? And so start shooting at you. And this is when you're told to evade. And you have to get away for X amount of seconds before they lose sight of you. And then they go back to patrol, right? So you reset that loop. Another huge game that decade was Half-Life. Half-Life is credited for some very robust AI in the 90s in first-person shooters. There's something like 80 some odd states, right? So really pushing the limits of what a finite state machine could do in those times. The Half-Life SDK is widely available and open. And I encourage any developer looking to poke behind the scenes on that to give that a download and check it out. Something of note that they did that I thought was very intelligent was assigning squads. And so that created the illusion of NPCs working together to um, team up against the threat, the player, right? So the way it worked is you would have a squad leader that they would identify something happened in the world, right? Very similar to what you saw in Metal Gear. And anybody who was in that leader's squad would immediately become informed of what that soldier is seeing, right? So again, creating this, this, uh, this illusion of tactical coordination amongst the AI, right? It was, it was very groundbreaking back then, and it continues to be a common tool that we use to this day. Now, we get into the 2000s. And with that, one particular game that resonates with me in 2004 is Halo 2. And they're credited for pioneering what we call behavior trees. And that pattern is still very much used today and ships integrated into a lot of dev engines and middlewares. One particular behavior that kind of made me jump out of my seat the first time I saw it, again, they're utilizing squads, right? The concept introduced in Half-Life to, to, to me anyway. Um, where you have your different roles and archetypes, like we saw in the Pac-Man ghosts. You have your grunts, the smaller NPCs, and you have your elites, the taller, more powerful, prominent ones. And there was this effect that happened when you killed the elites or their general or their leader, it would cause the grunts to flee. And this was so empowering as a player. You're like, how, why are they doing that? It's something you didn't expect and it completely surprises you. And it's totally uh, an effect of having these behaviors mapped out in a tree, right? Where they are in states that say, fight the player. However, when you go down a branch of the tree that says, hey, do you have a captain or not? If you have the captain, fight. If you don't have the captain, flee, right? So it's, a, it's an evolution of states as we know them, but behavior trees, became a way to handle the huge complexity that having so many states can lead to any developer trying to debug this. Later on in 2005, Monolith introduced GO, which is goal-oriented action planning. They simplified the state machine down to have three states where you move, right? You navigate in a space on a nav mesh that is running pathfinding algorithms, you animate, right? You, you interact with something, you, you sneeze, you pick up a weapon and you use a smart object, right? So they hid all the complexity behind these three small states in what is called an action planner, right? This is based off of STRIPS, a 1971 Stanford Research Institute problem solver. Uh, so shout out to Jeff Orkin, 
for a lot of his great work on this. And the way they did it, right, is just to give you a simple goal and the AI is left to form a plan and then run a star to figure out, okay, to get to my goal, which could be open a door, find the player, what is the fastest way there? And so it just becomes a sequence of actions. In 2008, we would see AI used very creatively in Left 4 Dead. They used what was called an AI director. So for pretty much my entire game design career, it's common for us to manually specify where an NPC is gonna spawn, what spawns, and when. And so in Left 4 Dead, they kind of left this up to a robot and they called it their director. So in a zombie survival game split between four players trying to cooperatively, cooperatively get out alive, it would lead to a unique experience every time you played. So you see, depending on the anxiety in the map, right? Like, is it too calm? That's when the director kicks into buildup, right? So they start spawning zombies and, 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 detect, and sending them after you in floods. And it leads to a peak where they spawn the special archetypes, right? Like the Pac-Man ghosts uh, of a brute tank or the damage dealing witch. If you somehow manage to survive those, the director would let you then relax and repeat that cycle over and over. Moving on to 2013, Forza Motorsport or has always had the notion of driver tars. And it was always learning how you drove. And it would save those behaviors. A big moment came in 2013 for Forza Motorsport 5 when this information was uploaded to the cloud and then other players could download it and play against them, right? So you're not playing against AI, you're playing against a version of another player who has been trained and then uh, systematized. They called it a Kai number, right? So you can see that it's very small data set from zero meaning you're inside of the track, one meaning you're outside of the track to the right, five b.5 in the center and that information is what would provide your behavior at any point right whether you're braking whether you're accelerating how hard you're doing that <clears throat> and this was all done using deep learning and then the last big thing that I want to talk to you about is the nemesis system in middle of our shadow of Mordor and war, right? This is revolutionary for so many reasons. Um, imagine you're in a third person action adventure game, you're fighting an orc, you cut him down. And then later on, he comes back and tells you, are you surprised to see me? You got lucky you got me last time. Or you take him down again with an arrow to the head. And in another play session on a completely different day, he comes back and says, taste my blade uh, and you will not get me again with arrows, right? He's wearing a helmet and completely adapts to you. This system was so groundbreaking that Warner Brothers actually applied for a patent for it in 2015. And it finally went through today, patenting several key aspects of that very robust system. I wanna to get to how AI works in helping developers make our lives simpler. We have various middleware and engine tools available that package up a lot of these pathfinding algorithms and basic behaviors, state machines, behavior trees, you'll see them in Unreal. NavPower is a prominent one I've used. Kythera AI is another one that I've used. Machine learning has been applied at Ubisoft LaForge in the form of a commit assistant. Right, this helps coders track down possible bugs to 79% precision. I imagine it's come a lot farther now. Procedural animation, right? It takes a lot of time to put someone in a mocap suit, film them with very high fidelity equipment. Nowadays, machines are being able to package and go through all that data and procedurally animate all the little leans and tilts and stutters and stops in a way that humans would take so much more time doing. Of course, there's also automation testing where we can train the game to play itself and identify some low hanging fruit and bugs. There's a ton more here. There's sentiment analysis, right? Being able to read uh, forums to see players, how they're feeling about a particular feature or run it through a stream chat and check out 
and even filter out inappropriate wording. Text to speech is another very helpful one, right? We spend a lot of time writing dialogue and casting voice actors to come in and record and it's very expensive. So in writing text that is then given some type of personality and even accent or language, it helps us get much farther before we ever have to commit to getting a talent in the booth. Content generation is another one where games can help us build the world in a very precise rule set. Finally, you know, where can we go in the future? There's a lot here that I'd love to see eventually come to fruition. Uh, and I think in the next 10 years, we'll start seeing a blend of machine learning being applied to make these games move and feel more lifelike. You'll be able to train them to generate environments and keep building worlds to keep refreshing experiences to satisfy our players' insatiable appetites for more. And just as it has always done, it will continue to offload some of our tedious tasks while challenging us to make new roles or master new skills and expertises to fully adopt and realize the new capabilities that AI affords us in bringing the world the most engaging, fun, and thought-provoking simulations imaginable in this decade and the next. Thank you so much. I enjoy talking about this all the time. Please find me at linktree slash jkingpin and let's connect. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, John. That was amazing. If you can stop sharing your slides, this virtual audience wants to give you a huge virtual round of applause. I know that made me wanna break out my old Xbox 360. <laughs> All right, for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.